And, you know, God is good. Um, it's kind of funny because, you know, the devil has really been attacking hard this week in a lot of areas. Uh, the one we just mentioned in prayer, obviously, is a major one. Uh, but I know this week, uh, me and, and Cora and Eric all went down with whatever that sinus thing was uh, and just kind of started getting better as the weekend started approaching. So, uh, you know, this is one of those where I'm like, you know, I'm not putting up with it. You know, God, you've given me an opportunity to do what you've called me to do, and I'm not missing out on it. So, praise God, here we are. Um, now, if you notice the logo, I'm not going to preach last Sunday's sermon again. <laughs> However... I did want to take an opportunity to go over this because, you know, as we're leading up to the 26th, there's a point to all this. We've been doing this church survey as a deacon board. We've gone through the Acts 2 process, the pastors mentioned. And as that survey went along, uh, you know, it kind of broke everything down into several categories. I want to try and take a look at that first of the day, kind of see how far into this we can get. And that one was dealing with connections. Now, as a church, we rated ourselves pretty high on connection. Now, this is, you know, fellowship time, um, getting to know one another, welcoming new people in, basically making those personal connections. And, you know, it's interesting to me. You know, I'm a big proponent of this, and I don't know necessarily that I could say this is something that works for everybody, but I will say this is something that works for me, and I, th I think there are scriptural bases for it. I love being out in nature. I love taking time to look at the things that God has created. And, you know, I'm always amazed because if you ever feel like, you know, like you're not important or maybe you're having one of those days where you're just like nothing you do matters and you're just kind of feeling down or you're just feeling displaced, this may sound crazy, but do a favor. Just go out and pick up a couple of leaves. And I know this sounds nuts, but what you're going to notice is if you look on the back of a leaf, it could be from the same tree. You notice all these little patterns, right? all these little veins, all the little intricate pieces put together. And there's no two of them that's alike. And then you stop and you look at every tree that you can see, just within what you can see where you're standing. And you realize that none of those are the same, that they're all different. And it would be enough of a miracle if every tree was identical. Like say they were all elm trees, right? But they're not. There's elm, there's hickory, there's oak. There's all these variety of trees. Every single one of them is, is individualized. And you know, that doesn't happen by accident. There's a grand architect, there's a creator who has that in mind, who takes the time to design each and every one of those. And you know, if he's going to do that just for a tree that most of us don't even pay any attention to, and then you go back and you look at his word, and you think, wow, you know, he didn't send his son to die for the trees. That was just for us. It kind of puts things in perspective. But, you know, God has a plan for everybody. And the connections that he forms in nature are a wonderful blueprint for what he expects from the church. Now, kind of like our pastor, I'm a big science fan. I love science fiction. Um, and I'm kind of a science geek. I, you know, I really do enjoy reading about physics updates and you know, quantum theory. I kind of enjoy that stuff. I don't understand all the math behind it. I'm, I'm not a, a mathematician by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I like reading the basic theory of it. But it's fascinating to look at it. I'll give you one with quantum physics that gets me. They've actually identified particles that, with the observations they've been able to do, it seems like at some points, instead of being static, you know, like most molecular bonds are static, they kind of have a fixed purpose. There are certain quantum bonds now that they've found that can actually move forward and backward in time, seemingly at random, but that there's actually a purpose to it. They've worked the math out to where they can find there's a purpose for this, but it's forward and backwards in time. Now, that's science fiction stuff, right? But they've been able to mathematically prove that this happens. You know, even if you go back into to molecules, you've got molecular bonds. You remember your chemistry, you've got all these things that, that all tie together, but it's all connected. Now, if you go with the more, you know, kind of nature approach that works for me, it, you've got your, your plants and your roots, right? Okay? You plant a root. You remember the, the parable from the Bible, right? You sow in the seed. Some went on good soil, some not such good soil, and all the things that happen. Seed that falls on good soil, what? It developed good roots, 
right? So when the heat came, it stood firm. You know, the book of Psalm talks about it. The tree planted by the water doesn't see when the heat comes because its roots are tapped into a, you know, the water source. But there's all this, this connectedness and purpose that God talks about. And so when I'm thinking about last week's sermon, I'm thinking, okay, I dream of a church. Well, our dream for a church should be, God, what's your dream for the church? What blueprint did you give us? What connectedness do we need to look for in, in a church? And I found out that the connection is really one of the most vital parts. And it surprised me because as I was doing this study, I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to take a look at connectedness. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, fellowship time, Sunday school, the interaction, it's important. We need to care about the people, obviously, we go to church with, right? They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to love them. We need to care. I never realized it was one of the most vital pieces, though. And I'm going to kind of walk you through this with what I found in Scripture, and I think you'll be kind of uh, maybe surprised about this like I was. As I broke this down, I looked at three areas for forming connections that we have to have in order to have an effective church. And the first one I identified as an inward connection. Now, if we look at John 3.16, we find one of the first key scriptures. And this is one we're all very familiar with, I think. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Well, in order to be connected... That's the first place we have to start, right? Because that's what makes us part of the body. So you can't plug in and be connected as part of the body if you're not part of the body. So this is the first step, right? Salvation. Well, what happens when we get saved? Of course, we're made new. We're renewed in the image of God, right? Look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. Remember, I was telling you those days you feel like you're down. Know you not that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. I think this is one that we may forget from time to time. It's not just that we're saved, and you know, you've heard the old adage, we're just sinners saved by grace. Well, you know, no, once you're saved, it doesn't mean you don't sin, you don't mess up, but according to God, now you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And God says where he's at, there can't be darkness, so you can't, can't have it both ways. So if the Spirit of God dwells in you, Now you're a vessel for something holy and something amazing. So that kind of elevates you up a little bit, right? Kind of like, wow, look what God's, you know, asking me to do. This is fantastic. Well, once we start wrapping our head around this part of it, and this one can take a while. (laughs) There's days I still feel like I'm trying to wrap my head around, you know, God, you really, wow, this this is what you've done. It's it's just amazing. You know, because we don't think in ourselves that, that we're worthy of this kind of thing. But, you know, God reminds us it's it's not what we think. It's what he says that matters. So once God saves us, and once we realize that we now have the, the spirit of God dwelling in us, well, now we need to do something with that, right? What What do we do with that? Well, from the aspect of growing the church, 2 Timothy 2.15 kind of gives us the the idea. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Once you become saved, regardless of whatever God calls you to do, first and foremost, he called us to be a workman. We have a job to do. We're to go forth and tell other people the gospel, tell them the good news. Whether you're called to be a preacher, called to be a missionary, whatever, you could just be in your workplace, but this is our job. Now, in order to form connections, though, they take time. And we have to start with ourselves before we can start reaching out. And I'm going to kind of show you that as we go through this today. But this is the first key in 2 Timothy. In order to be effective and in order to be where you need to be with God, the first question you have to ask yourself is, how much time am I spending studying to show myself approved? You know, I'll give you an example. If we have an average job, you know, say you spend at least 40 hours a week at work. You know, most jobs nowadays, it's more than that. But you're spending at least 40 hours a week at work. Now, when you first started that job, whether it was on-the-job training 
Or you may have a job where you have continuing education, so you're always in training. But think about the number of hours or the number of weeks it's spent for you to learn to just do the basics of your job. And then the more time you spend doing it, you get better at it and better at it to where it eventually becomes kind of routine. But you invest that time in it. Maybe eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, maybe just half your work day, but it's several hours a day that you're spending focusing on doing your job. Now, if you go back here and you say, okay, well, my job is, is I'm a workman for God. Okay, well, how do you become effective for God? Where is the manual? What, what do you have to be doing to find out what God needs you to do? What do you need to be equipped? Well, that's his word, right? And then go back and look at how much time do we spend in his word per week. If it's only on Sunday morning, okay, you know, maybe it's, it's a couple times a week. You know, I don't think we can ever say we're at a point where we're spending as much time as we want in, in his word. But that needs to be the first step in order for us to start looking out to say, God, what can I do? Is to start looking in and saying, God, what do I need to do to be where I can be useful? Because God's not going to equip you and train you if you're not spending time trying to get equipped and trained. He can call you to something, but if you don't put forth any effort to do it, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to be ready in that time. So that's the first step we have to look at. So we have to look inward. The second step when we're looking at being connected as a church is then we have to look amongst. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus gave us a commandment. And we look, find that in John 13, 34 and 35. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now, what we find is that love is what's going to lead to unity. And as we look at some of these other scriptures, unity is what we're going to find is required for growth. But it starts with that love walk. We look at 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. It says, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto what? Unfeigned love of the brethren. Now, what does that mean? Now, I like using the King James, and I know that's not something that we, we see a lot of nowadays. Um, I, I just, I've always enjoyed the language. Uh, but unfeigned love, now that's not, not a term you hear, you know, when you flip on the TV nowadays, right? Well, basically it means you're not faking it. You're not paying lip service to somebody. You know, it's not, you see somebody that comes in, they're wearing a new outfit. Oh, I love your dress. You know, and two minutes later, you're going, can you believe they wore that? I'm, you're, you're, not, you're not being fake, right? It's, it's legit. So you could, if you want to put this in modern terms, this is legit love, okay? <laughs> this is the real deal. So you see, you're not unfeigned love to the brethren. See that you love one another with what? A pure heart and how? Fervently. Now, what does fervently mean? That means you really want it. You really work at it. So the question that I have for myself, and that, you know, I think we should each ask is, okay, in my love walk with others, where am I at on that scale? If someone says, hey, can you pray for me? I have this problem. Do we think about it from week to week? Do we pray about it once, let it go? Do we stay with it? Do we ask questions? Do we follow up? You know, for me, this is one where, you know, you get busy, things go on, you get tied up with stuff, maybe you don't think about it as much. I would say for myself, this is one that in some areas I feel like I need to work on. It's like, it's not that I don't care, but do I care enough to make it a point to make sure it's happening every day? So are we doing this fervently? Because why? It says, look, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By what? The word of God that lives and abides forever. So that seed that God plants in our heart, that living word, right? Again, it's the word of God that's going to allow us to have this love walk, to walk in unity, so that we can have the right kind of connections with those that we're in a fellowship with. So it goes back to that first commandment or a new commandment that Jesus gave us. You know, love one another as I've loved you. 
Well, how did Jesus love us? That's a tall order, <laughs> you know, because Jesus loved us unconditionally. It didn't matter where we came from, didn't matter what we did. And now, as a church, we rated ourselves pretty high in this area, and I think with good reason, because I think this is an area that, as a church, we are doing well with. I know when Lynette and I first came here, uh, we felt right at home from day one. Everybody was very welcoming. People asked about us the next week we came, remembered our names. So I think we're doing a good job in these areas. So don't feel like I'm, I'm you know, saying, hey, we need to work on this. I think we're doing a great job, but I think as we go through these phases, as we look at these things over the next few weeks, we need to make sure we have a scriptural understanding of, hey, we're doing it great, here's why we're doing it great, or if we need to tweak it, here's why we need to tweak it. When we look at 1 John 4, 10, and 11, talking about love again, it says, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And that's a good reminder. Because remember, if God takes time to create, if God takes time to do these things, he does these things for us for a reason, as a reminder. As you're driving down the road, you see these things, they should be a reminder to us. God took the time to do this. If you see that sunrise, that sunset, that just kind of takes your breath away for a second, you know, that was God kind of hand-painting that. And if it spoke to your heart, you can say, hey, he did that just for me. Because maybe he did, because maybe it just touched you in that way and nobody else in that way. You know, God is amazing that way. He gives us these little things, but he does it as a reminder to say, hey, I love you. And he wants us to internalize that and then turn around and use that and say, hey, let us love one another the same way. Now, once we have the inward and the amongst down pat, this is where we can start now looking at outward. And this is where I want to kind of lead up to because this is what I thought was interesting. Unity, remember I said love leads to unity. Unity is required for growth. Well, look what happens because unity is what allows the spirit to move. Let's look in Acts 1.4. It says, these all continued with what? One accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now, this is talking about, um, we're going to get up into it in chapter 2. But you know, in the book of Acts, this is right after the ascension. And Jesus said, okay, now you're going to wait for a while. I'm going to send you a gift. Okay. So they all got together. Now that in one accord basically means they were all in agreement with one purpose. And it's important that they mention that they were there with the women because in Jewish culture, now you may have noticed this, if you've ever done any studies on the temple, anything having to do with temple worship, they had separate courts. You had the courts of the Gentile, you had courts of the women, and then you had the, the inner courts. So they always separated. You know, the men and the women had separate areas for prayer in Jewish temple worship. In this, this was kind of a, a, a new direction that God was showing for the church because the men and the women were all there praying together with one purpose and one accord. And you see this throughout Jesus' ministry. You know, there's constantly all these women that are being mentioned that have these, these I call them key roles because they, they made mention in the, the Gospels, some of them by name. But I think God was doing that to show that, that you know, hey, there's changes coming. And he was getting his disciples ready for some of this. Well, look what happens in Acts 2.1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were what? They were all with one accord in one place. So, okay, so they're told to wait. So they're all waiting. They're praying. They're in one accord. The day of Pentecost comes. They're all in one accord. They're in one place. They're all in agreement. They're all in unity. They're connected. And what happens? It's when the Holy Spirit came down. Tongues of fire, right? This is when we started seeing amazing, miraculous things happen that still happen today. This was not just thousands of years ago. Acts 2.46, and they continuing daily, what? With one accord in the temple, 
breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, that one really jumped out to me because I can't tell you the number of places I've gone to or heard of people talking about things. So many of these churches nowadays are trying to be everything to everybody. We have to have traditional worship, contemporary worship. We have to have, you know, Saturday worship. We have to do this kind of meeting, that kind of meeting. We have to have this kind of music, that kind of music. They are programming themselves to no end, trying to get everybody to come in. If we just make it this big mega thing with lights and smoke and shows and we'll draw them in like crazy. No, you know, you, you don't have to have all that. I'll tell you what, if, if you're ever in a dark place and you're trying to find your way out, the one thing you want to see is you want to see light. And you're going to walk towards the light. And according to the Bible that I've got, it says the light of the world is Jesus Christ. Now, if you have that in your church, <laughs> friends, you don't need anything else. And right here's your scriptural proof. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to, to, you know, be good stewards of buildings. We don't need to have new buildings. God's not against those things. But if you ever are looking to a worldly thing or a worldly program to grow your church, no. You pray, you ask God for wisdom. God, what do we need to have in place to be effective ministers of your gospel to the people? Because right here it says, the people continued in one accord. They were in unity. They were connected. And who added it? The Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Well, why does he do that? Well, let's take a look, and let, we'll go on a little bit, and I'll come back to that point. Acts chapter 4, 23 and 24 says, Being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with what? With one accord. <laughs> And said, Lord, you are God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. We see Acts 5, 12, and 14. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were what? All with one accord in Solomon's porch. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Are we seeing a theme here? I was really surprised when I got to this point because I'm going through Acts and if someone had said, okay, name me a passage where one accord comes up in the Bible. Well, Acts 2.1 is, of course, the first thing that pops into my mind. They were all with one accord, the upper room, the Holy Spirit came down. It's kind of hard not to be in a Pentecostal church for any length of time and not be familiar with that one. The rest of these, maybe not so much. And as I was thinking about connectedness, again, I'm thinking fellowship time, Sunday school time, you know, we just get to, you know, meet and greets, whatever. As I got to looking at this this week, though, I was amazed to find out that this is really one of the central points. You know, it doesn't necessarily matter if you've got the, the biggest and the greatest worship team. It doesn't matter if you've got 50,000 different classes going. If your people aren't in unity you're not going to be effective. And, you know, God gives us this example all around us every day, and we just don't maybe stop long enough to think about it. But, I mean, what would happen if, if say, you know, say this, just imagine for a minute, if you could, you plant a tree and the roots decide to grow straight up. Now, that sounds crazy, right? Roots go down, that's how plants work. But let's say that, that God gave them free will. He did that to people, right? And they just said, you know, no, I just I think roots ought to go straight up, forget it. Well, they're going to go straight up and the tree's going to die because it doesn't work that way. It's not going to be effective. You know, God gives us a purpose to follow. He gives us a model to follow in his word. And his first one is unity. And it's really at the heart of everything the new church required to grow now, up until this point in Acts 5, you basically, you have this nucleus of this new church that's growing. Christianity was a new movement, and it was in the heart of a pagan culture, 
uh, with, with the Roman Empire around them, or Judaism. And a lot of them, you know, obviously were, were, were Jewish at this point. They were all Jewish at this point. And so they were having to overcome things they had been brought up with. But they accepted the simple truths of the gospel without question. They accepted the Holy Spirit without question. And they were in one accord because they were praying, they were having faith in God, and they understood that God was faithful. And then we get up to the point in Acts 15. This is in verse 25. It says, it seemed good unto us, being what? Assembled with one accord. There's that theme again. To send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So at this point now, we've gotten to an area where the church has started to grow. They've started to do things internally. And because they've stayed in one accord, God has brought people to them. Remember, the Lord is adding daily to the church such as should be saved. God's bringing the pieces in. And as they stay in one accord and they grow, now they're able to pull people aside and send people out. And now we're at the go phase we can go forth and we can minister the gospel and we can be effective. I guess the question that I want to ask all of us, because I know that as, we're, we're, as what we looked at as a deacon board with this Acts 2, we really kind of took a look at everything the church is doing. What are we doing well? What do we think is not going so well? What do we think we could change? What do we think God wants changed? We really spent a lot of time over the, the last year kind of breaking these things down and really spending a lot of time praying about it. And again, save the date, February 26th. You're, you're going to want to be here for that day. But this is one of the first things that I want us to look at. Now, again, I think we do good as this as a church, so this is not a you know, finger pointing. But I hope that with these scriptures that you've maybe come to see it in a different light, that it's not just enough to be welcoming of guests, it's not just enough to be friendly. We want to do those things. But as a church, I know that, that for myself, and I've talked to a lot of people, they've said, you know, I really wish we could get out more in the community. I know it's on our pastor's heart. We really want to be, be you know, reaching the local community. That's why God put Dover Assembly where he did, is so that we could reach the Dover community. We want to continue to reach out into the world and fulfill the Great Commission. But we need to be an effective light here in our own backyard. Now, what does that look like? Well, in order to get to a point as a church where we can start making that decision and say, okay, God, here's where, you know, we want to work, or what do you think about these things? The first thing we have to check is we have to make sure that we're in one accord as a body. And the only way we're going to do that is by, number one, making sure that we're spending time with God and his word throughout the week and then making sure that we're spending that time in unity amongst one another, trying to fulfill the commandment from John 13 to walk in love. And then as we do these things, to pray about them, get together in one accord, and then go forth and be effective for God. Well, let's go ahead and close in prayer. I'm actually getting you guys done just a little early this morning, so... Uh, sure there's no complaints. God, thank you, Lord, very much for this opportunity to be here. God, I thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, very much for your power, God, to do these things. Lord, I thank you for the commission you've given all of us to be workers in your field. Your harvest is plentiful, God. You said the workers were few. And I thank you, God, that we are some of those few. I pray, Lord, that you would Help us as we go through the week, God, to be strengthened, to do the work you've called. And Lord, please show us, Father, areas where we need to improve or areas where we can help others, ways we can be of service, God, so that we're effective for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.